I'm scared. I'm scared for you, our Lord. Wow! Shut up, shut up. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Come on! Are you doing good or are you just not doing any wrong? <laughs> Bet, Lord, I got you. I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> Period. How do you shut up about that? How do you keep your mouth shut about that? Hola and hello, welcome back to Talks with Tally, a segment on my channel, Time with Tally, where I speak to you all and share with you the word that God has placed on my heart. Today, I'm very excited for this word because I'm actually recording it ahead of time. The Lord has allowed me to be able to prepare it before even the others have been recorded yet. So technically, this is actually episode six, I believe. I'm very excited about this word because this word I feel like has come at a perfect time because there are no coincidences in God. Without further ado, let's pray and let's get right into it. I come before you, Lord God, asking in this moment that it be you, Lord God, speaking today to the people, that they receive a revelation from you, Lord God, from the word that will come out of my mouth, Lord God, from the word that you have given me to share to your people, Lord. I ask in this moment, Lord God, that it be you, Lord God, healing, touching, encountering every single person through the sound of my voice in this moment, Lord God. For your glory, God, this is what the channel is for, Lord, to praise you and to glorify you, Lord God, and to extend our praise upon your name, exalt your name, your holy name. And I ask, Father God, that it be you touching their hearts and talking to them today, Lord. Let it be what you want them to hear. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray, amen and amen. So the title for today's word is Unfazed Boldness. Whoa, ooh, unfazed, bruh. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna read in Acts chapter four, verses 13 to 22. I'll read it for you. I have the New International Version of the Bible in case you do wanna follow along. Let's read. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John, some Bibles say courage, by the way, instead of boldness, go hand in hand, and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they were or after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred amongst themselves saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them. Clear to everyone living in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. Wow, God. But so that this does not spread any farther among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered for them to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Mm. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Wow, Father God. Wow, wow, wow. That is, whew, that's powerful within itself. So for those of you that don't know, the Sanhedrin is basically um, a Jewish council. It's, uh, it's a body, it's an administrative body. It's a judicial body in that time that they knew God's law and they would hold the people accountable according to their sins, their acts. You know, think of judge and trials and things like that when somebody brings a charge against you because you've broken some type of a law. So this was a council that would convene these people that they would see that were going against God's law. It was usually comprised of local elite members, educated members. This would usually be a composition of elderly people, scribes, which were also known as religious experts and priestly family. These men were untrained, uneducated, right? So by the word saying, that they were untrained, long story short, it meant that these two were just two common men, nothing special about them that they knew of. They were esteemed as illiterate. They weren't esteemed as elite or educated. They had no religious academic credentials. They were ordinary in their eyes, but not in Jesus' eyes. <laughs> ah! So amazing. Lord, I just love it so much because it's showing us that he can use whoever he wants. And actually a lot of the time he's going to bring light and put into a place of status and exemplify someone amongst other people that others deems not worthy, that others did not want to see, that others did not want to hear, that they did not care about. Ooh! Oh my gosh, Lord. 
<laughs> I just want to get you guys some context for what happened in the story so you can kind of catch up and see what's going on here. So let me just look up the details because I know the details, I just don't want to be wrong. <laughs> These verses are referencing a point, a story um, right before that in chapter three, where it speaks about where John and Peter healed a lame, a lame man. So it was a man that could not walk. He was lame from birth and every single day when he would go to the temple to beg in front of the doors and gates of the temple, he would be carried there. So usually he would, you know, beg for money. And so he would see people and his intention would be, let me ask them for money because I have already gotten so comfortable in my situation, Lord. I have already gotten so comfortable with my paralysis. I have already gotten so comfortable sitting here and being carried here and other people have treaded me along because I can't do it for myself that now I don't ask for a miracle anymore. I just ask for money. And Peter had said to him, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Woo! Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up to the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. Oh my gosh, okay. And that's why this is so powerful too, because you have to note the symbolism right in the word, but also note directional terms, like right, left, um, numbers, all this stuff, truly it means something, right? And so when you look at this, it says in the verse, oh, and since they saw the man who had been healed, standing with them. They had seen the miracle and it was right in front of their eyes. So they could not deny it. It was obvious. It was clear to the people that had seen this happening. Because I'm telling you, when God comes into your life and he makes a change, it's obvious. You don't have to speak on it. Your testimony will speak for yourself. You know how many people have come to me nowadays and they're, they're like, oh, you've changed so much. Like you, you're glowing. What's different? There's something different about you. That's Jesus. I'm literally not kidding. I'm not better than nobody. It literally is that he's changed my life entirely from the inside to the out. Unfazed, the word unfazed, it signifies not disconcerted or perturbed. Unwavering is the word that kept coming to mind when I thought of this. Standing firm and unchanged. But side note, I wanted to put in here, it doesn't mean not affected, but we'll get to that later. It just means it's not changed. It's strong. It's firm. It's a foundation. <laughs> Boldness is defined as a willingness to take risks and act innovatively, which is unlike others. Innovatively in indicates that you are creating something or trailblazing or doing something new that others haven't done. You're taking chances where others may not have. Wow, Father God, thank you. Listen, this stuff is not in my notes. I'm gonna let the Holy Spirit guide me, Santo Dio. Glory to you, Father, thank you, Lord. It is also signified as confidence or courage, the quality of having a strong, vivid, or clear appearance. And this, my friends, this is what this word is for. This should be your stance. To stand in what he has done in your life in boldness, to preach the gospel with boldness, to speak the good news of what he's done for you and what he's promised you. Because the best thing about a promise is actually in God's time, it's already done. <laughs> you just have yet to see it yet. I have to be very, very honest and transparent as I have always been. I'm gonna give a quick testimony here. You know, I find it very, very funny because <laughs> I find it funny. I feel like that's just like a, a petty term, but no, I, I do. I find it very interesting, at least I'll say, because, you know, the people surrounding me when I was secular, when I was in the world and I wasn't not walking with Christ or living like Christ, you know, anything like that. When I was separated from God, all my friends and all the people around me, they, they they were applauding, they were cheering me on. They were encouraging my loudness, my boldness in my drinking, my partying, my dancing and throwing my butt in a circle. Let's be real. They were encouraging me sleeping around with a bunch of people if I wanted to. But now that I found Jesus, my life has been changed forever. He saved me, he's made me new. I'm a whole different person. I no longer desire the things that are of no worth to me and actually were destructive towards me without me even realizing it. Now that I'm loud about him and how he saved my life, now people don't don't wanna cheer. Nobody wanna clap. Nobody wanna encourage that or support it in any way. It's a, uh, all right, you go do you over there. Let's be honest, that's what happens because people don't have the same beliefs. And it is what it is. I respect your opinion to have your own opinion, but how hateful of a friend would I be if I didn't share with you the good news of this wild transformation, an undeniable, unshakable effect that he's had on my life. You can't deny, I'm literally sitting in front of you. 
I'm not the same person and you say it yourself, yet we still seek out different routes to doubt. And it's interesting how that works because now that I'm not loud in my sin anymore, but I'm loud in him, nobody's around to hear or to place a speaker in front of my mouth and make it louder for others to hear. Instead, it's more so you do you, but not too much. I got into a fight with actually one of my friends recently and it was when the enemy likes to attack you, he likes to go for the things that have made you insecure in the past were positions in your past where you've been unstable and un insecure. One of the things I had always struggled with growing up was the fact that I have always been a pretty out there loud personality. I've always been really passionate. I've always been very <laughs> and that's something that I used to get made fun of a lot for growing up, right? Because I was always that way and I was always weird and odd and a little bit nerdy and I stood out. And that's the thing that I didn't want. I didn't want to stand out until God came in and said, that's exactly what I made you for. That was not in my notes. Father God, thank you. When someone would say to me, you're too hyper, you're too loud, you're too passionate, that would hurt because I was the essence and the core of my being, of my character. Early on in you know my early 20s or whatever it may be, I do believe at that point and in that season of my life, part of it was attention seeking behavior without really knowing it sometimes. Sometimes, yes, I knew. But once I healed and I came to God and I realized that it really didn't go away that much, <laughs> I realized that this boldness, this authority, this voice, this energy, this who I am is what he's meant me to be and how he's meant me to be. This is how he carved me. This is how he built me. This is how he created me. My potter in heaven has made me in this way. I am fearfully and wonderfully made exactly as I am. Not in my sin, but in this character. What the enemy wants to use for me to seek attention with, God uses it to now preach his word. Ooh! With the same voice that used to condemn, the same tongue that used to say evil things and nasty things and condemn myself, talk down to myself, is the same mouth, the same tongue that's now speaking life unto people. It's now speaking love and light that only God can provide. How amazing is that? Wow. So when I got into this fight with my friend, I remember at one point it got really heated because actually the conversation started talking about God. Even the slightest mention of God, your spirit will irritate and the name of Jesus will irritate the spirits of other people. Again, I'm no better than anybody, but that's just the honest truth because it happened to me. When I would hear about God, I'd be swiping. When I would see a message online, I'd be like, bye. Bye, I don't wanna hear none about it. Like deuces. When I would hear people preaching, I'd be like, mm, in the streets, anywhere. If God was mentioned, I was just like, mm, because what they had, that happiness they had, that spirit of the Lord that they had was irritating the spirits that I had, that I had to be delivered from. So when I had been arguing with my friend about certain things, it got to a point where this was early on, of course, I wasn't as firm in my character yet and acting Christ-like in certain things. And so I was talking about God, but I was also getting very defensive and protective of God because don't talk about God that way. I allowed that feeling to get farther than it probably should have. Because although I didn't cuss at the person, I didn't say mean things to the person, I did get upset and that was made obvious. And the enemy used that against me to then have my friend say, you do realize that you're just too loud. You're just too passionate sometimes. That was my soft spot. I knew my friend knew I was upset. I don't think that my friend knew how upset and how hurt I was. And so me and my friend were fine. We are perfectly fine now. We've had a conversation and there's been forgiveness and the Lord is working. I know the Lord is working in that person and in our relationship, but that was necessary for me to now seek my identity through him and in the boldness that he has created me for and he has also created you for. It's great because I went from feeling like I was too much for everyone to being comfortable in my loudness with him because he accepts that from me. <laughs> it's beautiful. The Holy Spirit wants to remind you that he has called you to be bold. His word says so. To be unrelenting in your faith and to stick out if you need to. This doesn't necessarily mean pushing things down people's throat, but also don't be scared to share your faith if you feel that the Holy Spirit is inclining you to speak on it because there may be somebody around you that needs to hear it and seeds need to be planted whether or not in that moment they accept Christ. Remember, it's not our job to save. Jesus Christ's name literally signifies salvation. It signifies rescue. He's the one that came to save them, not you. Even though it hurts and you wanna save everybody, you cannot do that. It's not in your job description. Your job is to plant the seed.
and allow him to cause it to grow and flourish. Stop worrying. Worry is a sign of distrusting God. You need to focus on him and give it to him. Focus on what you got to do with God because your salvation is individual. Believe it or not, there are some believers out there that actually hide their faith. Some because of certain situations in certain countries are not allowed to. Do you know how lucky we are to be able to share our faith as of now? Because I'm sure there will be a time that we won't be able to. But there are parts in the in this world right now that people can't speak openly about their faith. They can't go to Christian churches. We are lucky, so lucky and blessed. It's not even luck, it's blessed. That's what we are. It's a blessing to be able to speak about him and preach his word and do the things that he has called us to do openly. But it's true, some people, even if they're not in other countries, whatever it is, some people still hide their faith due to fear. What will people think? What will I say if somebody asks me a hard question? That was one of my things. That's why I didn't mention it in certain arenas. Now I don't care where I go. I'll mention it if I feel the Holy Spirit's inclining me to, or any open chance I get, to be honest. <laughs> but there are some believers even walking around you now that you don't even know that they're believers because they hide that fact out of fear because they're not stepping into their boldness and to their confidence and having courage. Mm. We're gonna get into courage in a little bit as well. It's really so amazing because people are able to stand in boldness and have courage and stick out when they have confidence in something, when they have identity in it, they see a truth in it. So I'm here to remind you that you should be proud and excited and happy and boisterous about the fact that you have discovered the truth you have discovered the truth of eternal life and real love, which is Jesus Christ. So it's important to remember you will stick out. And his word says so. His word says so in Matthew 10, 16, it says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. First of all, just picture that in your head. Imagine a pack of wolves in one or two little sheep. It says in his word that, that the harvest is huge and ripe, yet the harvesters are few. So now imagine a pack of wolves, a bunch of wolves, a little bunch of gray wolves, whatever it may be, and a few sheep. First of all, the color contrast is crazy because it says that we are light in darkness. You are that one beam of white light in a crowd of gloom and dark grayness. That's how we're meant to stick out. And it's not just by how we look. It's the character of each of these creatures that he's talking about. The lambs are seen as are symbolic of, you know, purity, innocence, sacrifice. The wolves are known to be killers, to hunt prey. So you're not really meant to fit in with the majority. And whilst you're in this crowd, it says, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes. Therefore, being astute, being smart, being sharp because we have to always be on alert with what's surrounding us. It's dangerous. Your environment can be dangerous. The Holy Spirit is representative of, um, is represented as doves in his word. You need to be like Christ and you need to remain innocent among the guilty. Speaking on the topic of boldness, it's funny because boldness also has to do with being unashamed. Oof. With lacking embarrassment. There were numerous times when I was reading the Bible when I first had given my life to Christ and I was reading the word and it said that there were numerous times that Jesus, before he even proclaimed that he was the Messiah or he even came out as who he was, right? He had performed some type of miracle or healing where he told the person that witnessed it, go and tell nobody of what you've seen. <laughs> so as to not bring attention to him, right? And I used to ask, I'm like, God, why would, be, be, why would people be disobeying you and, and not listening when you say, you know, don't go tell anybody? Because then people would then follow up after he says that and immediately go run into the public crowds and then be like, this is what Jesus did for me <laughs> and proclaim it to everybody. And I was like, did they not just hear what he just said? <laughs> but it's so true that when he steps into your life and he does that kind of a change in you, in your life, you're like, how can I not? How could I possibly not proclaim and be ashamed of what he's done? How do you shut up about that? How do you keep your mouth shut about that? I know I haven't shut up about it. 
<laughs> it's been months and I still haven't shut up about it. And you know why? It's because not only does he come in and change you once, sometimes it can take a little bit of time. He's changing you every single day, every day. As long as you see him every day. He's capable of performing miracles on a daily basis. You just gotta ask him to open your eyes so you can see. But definitely one of my favorite verses in this aspect is in Matthew 10, to proclaim what I hear and whisper. The things that he has shown me, the things that he has revealed to me, the things that he has said to me through his word, through my dreams, how can I not share his goodness and his wonder? Because this goes so much further and so deeper than just a cute song on Sunday. This spiritual life, this life of faith and walk with him is so much deeper than anybody could imagine. Matthew 10, 27, it says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. <laughs> Bet, Lord, I got you. I'm gonna keep doing it. <laughs> so in these moments, I want you to ask yourself, when you're lacking boldness, are you doing good? Or are you just not doing any wrong? Ask yourself, are you actively living in obedience of faith and going the extra mile for what it is that he has said for you to do or how he would want you to act? Or are you just sitting plainly and only avoiding your old wrongdoing? Because faith is followed by action. When they picked up this lame man, they grabbed him. Peter grabbed him by the right hand and he said, stand up. It is followed by action. He said the word in the name of Jesus Christ, get up. And he followed it with an action and helped his brother up. Ah! There's nothing wrong with avoiding your old wrongdoing. That's, you should be. But I'm just here to remind you that he's calling you to more than that. You're not meant to stay where you are. I remember I also lacked in, in the beginning of my walk with Christ. I lacked boldness, not only solely for the fact that it was, you know, for approval of others to accept me and who I was. I lacked boldness due to the fact that I didn't want to shove this down anyone's throat. I didn't want to push it on anybody. Therefore, in turn, pushing people farther from God. I didn't want to be the reason that somebody is pushed away from God. Actually, on the contrary, I wanted, to them, I wanted them to come to God, but I didn't want to turn them off to the idea of God because when someone gets pushed a lot, they tend to just run the other way. Pushing doesn't usually work. <laughs> in case you haven't learned that already. And then I realized that that wasn't my job to save anybody, nor is it my responsibility to help God help. God doesn't need help. Your delivery of his word, yes, you may have to package it somewhat differently for a new beginner, a, a new believer, because you should probably make it audience appropriate so they're understanding what's happening, bring it to their level so they can understand what you are saying and what the gospel is. But remember that their feelings in response to what you say has nothing to do with you if you're doing it correctly and if you're doing it by God's will and direction. God doesn't need your help to soften people's heart. <laughs> My job and your job is the seed. The fruit aspect is his job. So therefore, we cannot dilute his truth, but also realize who you are talking to and how to present this to them. Some people will not want to hear the truth no matter how you put it. But now imagine it's going to get to the point that God will have to speak to someone a certain type of way that they actually will hear. I mean, think about it. There's going to be people that he's going to have to say. And I saw this on uh, the Facebook post. It was like, it's not really necessarily the, the delivery for some people. It's what's being said that they don't want to believe. And the lady said, imagine your friend is getting hit by a truck. You see the truck coming and... They're literally on a path of self-destruction. They're about to die. They're walking in front of this truck. You don't say to them, oh, but, but wait, there's a truck. Please come back. You say, hold up, there's a truck. Move. See the difference? When it comes to saving someone's life, which I know of being a nurse, but even just in general, this is common sense. You, you know that when it comes time, for someone's life to be saved, we don't care about the delivery, right? So that's why God has given us this time to be able to sit in his grace and receive his word in a way that we can understand and receive it 
with that calmness, that gentleness, that kindness, until we get to the point that we can understand more depth of what's really going on in this spiritual war warfare realm. But some that do know better, or that God is calling at an accelerated rate for a greater purpose, they may need to be spoken to in that way, as if it's an emergency against their life. Wow. Wow, Lord, let it be you speaking, Father God. Thank you, Lord. And I was one of those that he kind of had to yell at. And ever since I came to the feet of Christ again this time, it's been nothing but speed, acceleration. This, I can barely keep up with all the wonders that he's doing. Luke 9, 26, it says, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Do not be ashamed of him, so he is not ashamed of you. I said, I said this in actually one of the words I had just recorded a little bit ago, and it was people tend to feel judged or attacked, when in reality, that's not what's happening. I want you all to remember that it says it in his word that the same measure in which we treat others while we are here on this earth is how he will judge us up there. So if we're ashamed of him in front of others, okay, he'll be ashamed of us then. So when I say that people feel judged or whatever it may be, if we were to judge and condemn others, that's the same way that he will judge and condemn us when we reach heaven. So heed my advice when I say, treat others here and yourself here the way that he would want to treat you. Because what's done on earth is done in heaven. Wow. What's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Acts 4, 29 to 31, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. This is when they started to pray for an abundance of boldness. They prayed, Lord God, give us the boldness. Because you can ask for this. If you need this, ask for it. In verse 30, it says, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the whole place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. A prayer for boldness is sometimes necessary and that's perfectly okay. It's not easy to stick out or to be bold. And actually sometimes it can be lonely. It's a lonely walk at times. For some reason, I thought of the, uh, like, Imagine the personification of bold font. When you write a paper and you use bold font, right? That's how we should be as a person. If you were to have a paper, right, where all the other words that you have typed, they all blend in together. It all just looks like one big blend of words. But what happens though, when you see bold font, your eyes go directly to see it. It sticks out. It's different from the rest. And the content, the rest of the words in the paper need to revert back to the bold font, to the title. The bold font will provide the direction for where the paper is going. Wow, Lord. God, you're crazy. <laughs> Glory to God. Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know what this is telling you? It's saying, let us appear boldly to his grace because that within itself is a testament. It's a testament of your belief in him and your belief of his word that he has forgiven you and has grace and has mercy. I'm not saying use God. I'm not saying take advantage of his grace. If you don't come to him boldly and say, Lord, I messed up again. I didn't want to. I don't know what's wrong with me. If you're not bold about it, you're not fully stepping into your belief in him. God is requiring raw, real honesty. What he wants from you is for you to say, I need you. It's kind of like when people say, however public your, your shame is or like your trespass is, let your apology also be as public, right? So the same way that you were so bold in your sin prior, come boldly to him for forgiveness. To be bold is to have courage. And this is when we get into the topic of the fact that, remember how I said, it doesn't change your boldness, but it does affect it. This is where we talk about it. It says, to be bold is to have courage. John 16, 33, it says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. 
We have to share the word of God who liberates and sets people free. This also means to liberate people from what they think the church is, who they think that God is. From trauma, from hurt, from pain, from scars and previous teachings, teaching them and guiding them on how to unlearn the things that they already knew, which is actually probably one of the hardest things of all in the journey. We need to restore them and bring them back to a state that they were at before originally, or actually better actually better. The Lord always does better and heal what's been broken. Restoration is defined as the action of returning to something to a former owner. Ooh, a former owner, place, or condition. Liberation is defined as the act of setting someone free from imprisonment, slavery, oppression, aka release. Wow. What's needed right now in this world is example. Example is that physical evidence that everybody's looking for. Testimonies are the physical evidence of what it is that God has done. That's what people need. And not only do they see, need to see it once, they need it in consistency. They need to see that with consistency because what they've already seen once before, probably by a few, a, a few times, what they had seen, they'd already been tricked by. And it ruined God for them. So now all of us need to stand in unity as Christ-like believers and followers of God and show them what this is really supposed to be like there are no cracks in this pavement. Wow. What is courage? You're almost done, y'all. I just want to say this really quick because I need you to understand that although you still act according to how he says to and you do things in faith because faith is always backed by action, there will be times that you do things that maybe you don't even want to do that God is telling you to do. And then you see afterwards, you're like, oh, Okay, I see why you told me to do that. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it won't have an effect on you, but that means that you still do it anyways. You still are bold regardless. Courage is the ability to do something that frightens one. It strengthens the face of pain or grief. What you need to take from this is the fact that being bold and having courage and confidence in what you're doing and standing out, it does not come with lack of fear or pain or grief. Courage is not categorized by the absence of fear. And I'm gonna say it again for a reason. And there will be a point where you need to rebuke the fear in Jesus' name and cast it out. Because sometimes people allow their fear to debilitate them and paralyze them in a way that they will not move and they won't do the things that God has commanded them to do because they're so fearful. And that's when it becomes a serious problem, when it becomes a hindrance to your obedience and faith. Three of my favorite people in the Bible, it's actually probably my favorite Bible story, is the story of Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which um, they're, they are known for sticking out, not only in their character, but also in the fire. Wow, Lord. They said, our Lord will deliver us, hand delivered, and the Lord did deliver. These three were sent into a fire by the king of that time because the king wanted them to bow down to this God statue that he created of himself. He created a man-made statue slash God idol thing for them to praise and worship and bow down to. And they said, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Sorry, not sorry. I'm not doing that. And when he said, I will throw you into the fire, a furnace that literally used, was used to kill people. I actually have to just read it for you guys because it's crazy. Daniel chapter three, verse 16, they said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, which I can't even say that name. We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Period. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, ooh, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Come on. That is the exact type of boldness that he's calling us to. Wow, or make me like them. <laughs> The Lord hand delivered them out of that fire. In case you don't know the story, sorry for the spoiler alert. He raised the fire seven times greater for them because he got so angry that they wouldn't worship his idol that he created. He said, turn it up seven times more. Little did he know 
that seven represents and symbolizes perfection. And that when they would look into that furnace to see them burning alive, which is what they expected, they saw a fourth man in the fire. Our Lord. Wow! That's just... And when they came out of that fire, they were not burned. There was not one inch of their clothing had been singed. They walked out alive and well, protected, bold still in their faith. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? If that were me, not for nothing, I'd be a little petty. I'd be like, told you. <laughs> Let's be for real. The thing about courage is the fact that, like I said, you will have to go against what you feel and sometimes even go against what you want. And actually following Christ is courageous within itself because you know that you're gonna be hated. It's biblical that people will persecute you just because you follow Christ. And actually, we have to die little deaths every single day. We die to our flesh every single day. I wanna be a bad person. I wanna sin sometimes. I wanna have that fun because of course sin is fun and easy because I wanna do the things that feel fair to me. I wanna get revenge and I wanna make others feel exactly how I feel. I wanna get even. How much more power, courage, and gut does it take to actually do the complete opposite and let others think about me, whatever it is that they want? And a lot of us that have, have had struggles with pride, we tend to think that that makes us weak. Not really knowing that that actually makes us so strong. Because one thing about me, that was something that I definitely struggled with. We don't want people to think that we're weak just because we let people, you know, walk all over us. That's not letting people walk all over you. Because at the end of it all, your redeemer is the Lord. And he fights for you. And when someone messes with one of his children... I'm scared for that person. I'm scared. I'm scared for you. Just remember what Christ has taught you. That in certain situations when your faith and your character and your Christ-like behavior is being tested, he has shown you what to do. He has taught you what to do. Don't allow others that don't have the same spirit as you to taint your testimony. I need to remind you that some of the major prophets within themselves, they were scared, but they had the courage and the boldness that the Lord has placed upon them. We have been given authority. His word says that we have been given authority. His word says in Luke 10, 19, it says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Nothing will harm you. Wow. Daniel even speaks in his book how he was so fearful and terrified by the things that he had seen in the visions that the Lord had given him. Elijah, probably one of the boldest prophets, became scared of Jezebel's commands because she said she was going out to get him and make sure, basically, long story short, that he was dying. He was going to die. She had a bounty for his head. And what did he do? He ran for his life. You think David cared about sticking out when he fought a giant? You think the woman that was a sinner that poured perfume on Jesus' feet and bathed his feet in her tears. Do you know how much tears, how many tears it would take to bathe someone's feet? Do you think they cared about sticking out? What other people said? What matters is what he, the Lord says about you. Wow, thank you, Lord. That woman was in a crowd of people that literally were openly judging her. And Jesus called out the man that began it, called her out for being a sinner. And Jesus said, well, that's funny because she bathed my feet in perfume, has been a humble woman with a good heart posture. Yet this is your house and you didn't even offer me water to drink. You didn't wash my feet for me, which was a custom in that time to do for your guests. The other woman that with the issue of blood for 12 years, pushed through an entire crowd. And if people found out, which they would, because she had so much faith that he would perform that miracle and heal her from that sickness publicly. She knew this was public, yet she also knew that she didn't care enough about what people would say. She was bold enough to step in faith and run after his garment to just touch his garment because she didn't even plan on touching him knowing that that would make him unclean. But she had a bold faith. And Paul, Saul of Tarsus, the actually probably the boldest man in the Bible. He was a persecutor of Christians. He literally would seek out people that would follow Jesus Christ and kill him, get him sent to prison. And he had to suffer a lot for the purpose that Jesus had for him. 
But when I say that after he actually gave his life to Christ and he started writing all the letters that he did and preaching the gospel in the way that he did, that man is the depiction, the epitome of boldness. And what's even crazier is that specifically about Paul, he stood out even more in the crowds because people knew who he was before. I also want to note someone else. And this is the last one. There was a Roman centurion. Romans were the ones that were holding the Jews captive at this time. And he made a very bold move. He came to Jesus and asked him for a miracle. But he had that bold faith too, to back up his bold move. You need to be bold and share a truth that some may not want to hear, that some may not believe in, that some will not deem welcome, and that won't make people feel so good. It's time for you to act in boldness and have courage in order to access the authority that the Lord has already placed inside of you. You just have to tap into it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, God is crazy. Um, and I love it in the best way ever. He's not crazy, but you know what I'm saying? My mom hates what I say. God is crazy, but like, imagine how amazing he is. He's so amazing. He's almost, unfa he's unfathomable to the human mind. So sometimes I'm like, wow, God, you're so wild. You're crazy. Like this is, you blow my mind every single minute I get to spend time with you. All right, let's pray really quick. We're done for today. Thank you so much for listening to that word. I feel like it was definitely one that resonated so much with me. So let's pray and I'm gonna let y'all go. Father God, I wanna come to you in this moment, Lord God, saying thank you so much for the opportunity, Lord God, to be able to share the word that your Holy Spirit has placed upon my heart, Lord. I wanna say thank you for each person under the sound of my voice in this moment, Lord God. I wanna say thank you so much for the fact that they've been able to listen to this word that you have placed in my heart, Lord, but also that I am aware and I'm sure and I'm certain and I have the bold faith to say that you have spoken to at least one person on the other side of that screen, Father God. There are no mistakes in you, Lord God. There are no coincidences. So I know for a fact that someone has heard your voice today through this message, Father God. I ask that in this moment, Lord God, it be you guiding them on your path, Lord God, everywhere that they may go, Lord God, keep them safe, place your angels all around them, Father God, encounter every single one of them in a way that's undeniable, unshakable, provide to them clear and obvious signs of who you are so they may not negate the truth of who you are, Father God. Thank you, Father. And in Jesus' name, I pray that this word be a blessing upon each one of their lives, Lord, right now, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Glory to God. Thank you all of you for joining me today. And I will see you next time on Talks with Tally. I hope you enjoyed that word. Glory to God. I'll see y'all later. Bye.